Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching today's long-range technical forecast video brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions. This analysis is being provided for perspective only, and any decision made based upon this presentation is the sole responsibility of the person making the decision. Finally, please remember that all long-range weather forecasting is speculative by nature. We start first with a map that shows the last two weeks of precipitation expresses a percent of normal, and this goes through yesterday on the 29th, early in the morning. So over the last uh, 24 hours or so, we've actually seen quite a bit of rainfall coming through parts of the Northeast, which has been great as that area has been extremely dry given the end of summer pattern we saw in that region. You can also see the influence of Hurricane Sally which went right in through here and also Tropical Storm Beta which came through this part of the lower Mississippi River Valley and then eventually ended up here over in the Mid-Atlantic as well. Notice too the very wet conditions due to that deep trough that cut through the Pacific Northwest but in this particular map I want to focus on some of the drier areas. Now right in through the Corn Belt and through this region drier conditions this time of year typically mean better harvest efforts. But if you get down here to the southern plains where we're trying to get a winter wheat crop planted, these dry conditions are causing issues. That and the fires in the western part of the United States, we're waiting on the return of rains here for California as we move toward the wet season. And we'll talk about these regions as we move forward in this forecast. But thinking about drier places, I want to give you a quick international update. Coming over into parts of eastern Ukraine and the southern Russian wheat belt into this area, we've seen that over the last 45 days, much of this region's had between 0 and 30% of normal rainfall. You can really notice that by taking a look at this precipitation graph I created for southern Russia. And what we've got here is that really since, uh, gosh, this would be August, this area has had almost a flat precipitation curve, missing out on a lot of precipitation in this area. So the wheat planting in this region needs more moisture in order to get that crop to germinate before we get into the upcoming, uh, well, late fall and winter time period. We do notice that over the next several days, deep troughs keep cutting here into this part of Europe. And we're going to split the much of Europe over into a warmer eastern side and a cooler western side. It's going to be very unsettled in the midsection uh, of Europe here. A lot of very wet days and very cold and windy days coming up with these troughs. We do expect in parts of western Ukraine wetter than average conditions, but notice here in the southern Russian wheat belt, drier conditions are expected to continue. When we think about South America, look back over the last 30 days or so we can see that when compared to normal, we've actually been drier than normal. Now, about this time of year, we start to expect the monsoon to kick up. In fact, look at the precipitation figure over there on the right from Mato Grosso. You notice that once you get to the end of August and start September, precipitation amounts normally start to increase. And as we get into October, November, December, they really start to shoot up. Well, we know that their uh, dry season, which is during their winter, was drier than normal. And then we've had a real slow start to the monsoon. And the question is, is that going to continue to be a factor? As we look out over the next 10 days, this is from the European model, we once again continue to see precipitation deficits, not only in Mato Grosso, but also through Brazil's southern growing areas and also in Paraguay, the only exception being down here in Rio Grande do Sul. And then looking out here for the month of October, we do see deficits in Brazil's northern growing regions and also in Paraguay and Argentina. But there are some hints of the return of the monsoon coming here into parts of eastern Brazil. Now remember, the, the main point to make here is that if the rains do not return, allowing for the planting progress to pick up as we work through the month of October, in other words, if there are delays at the end of October, this is where things start to really matter. And where it matters is with not so much the, the soybean crop, because uh, it, it'll still get in, still get the rain, and, and, and it'll grow, but it's going to be with the timing of the planting of the safrina corn and cotton. Now, as we look out longer term, October 13th through November 13th, we do start to see more meaningful precipitation return to Brazil's northern and central growing areas. But I want to talk about southern Brazil and Argentina, because that particular region, I believe, is going to be susceptible to this developing La Nina. We've noticed that over the last several weeks, this La Nina has become stronger. The trade winds have gotten strong and have stayed strong, and we have plenty of cold water beneath the ocean surface here that can still upwell. Our ocean temperatures are now hovering between minus 0.8 and minus uh, 1, minus 0.8 and minus 1 degrees Celsius below normal, which would give this almost moderate strength lining to characteristics. Now, the reason why I want to discuss this is because generally, as we look out longer term for South America, a developing La Nina tends to produce drier conditions in southern Brazil and in Argentina. But understand that that correlation is quite weak. It's not strong, but it could be a dominant factor moving forward. Now, coming back to North America, if the La Nina background state of the atmosphere continues, that tends to suggest that the Pacific Northwest and 
the Northeast tend to stay wetter. We tend to not see the early onset of the development of the strong subtropical jet stream, which tends to cut into California, increasing rainfall there. And you notice that there's a broad sector of the U.S. that actually tends to be on the drier side of things. Now, remember, when we think about La Nina, I want you to see here that these correlations are weak. Notice they're down here in the 0.1 to 0.3 range or the plus 0.1 to 0.3. These are not strong correlations, but this is something in the background state of the atmosphere that I want to watch. The other factors to be considering here are the polar jet stream. We're going to talk about that in a few moments. Now, given that we're concerned about the moisture returning to both California and also the wheat belt, the southern plains of the United States, I went out and I grabbed a map or I made a map here that shows the driest Octobers for the wheat belt in the southern plains of the United States. And that jet stream pattern tended to feature a deep trough, as you see here. Uh, in the Gulf of Alaska near the Aleutian Islands, a big ridge in the west, which would keep things hotter and drier in the west, and a trough that sits somewhere here between the east coast getting up here toward Greenland uh, in the Hudson Bay. Now that particular highly amplified flowed pattern will do something like this. And if that sets up in that configuration, we tend to get a lot of upper level convergence right here in the central plains of the United States and things tend to be drier. Let's see if something like that is in the forecast. Starting this off, we certainly see our deep trough here and the trough that's over the Great Lakes toward the Hudson Bay. And as I play this forward, those two features tend to stick around even through the weekend. We even get some upstream blocking at that point. Look at the large ridge pushing toward Greenland, and then the deep trough that's almost a high over low setup here across parts of Europe. This large ridge building north of this of Scandinavia here is going to be something of interest because I think it's going to reinforce the development here of the trough that is over parts of Alaska, the Aleutian Islands, the Bering Sea. Now, as we move forward in this forecast, let's get out here to next Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. A few things start to take shape. Our upstream block is still present. We get the redevelopment here of troughing that cuts into eastern North America. But notice at this point, our next trough in the Bering Sea here, beneath it has a ridge. And therefore, the gesture winds are going to be quite fast in this area. And that, I think, is going to allow the pattern to progress across the Gulf of Alaska. And by day 10 in the forecast, allow a trough to cut into the Pacific Northwest. Now, what that will do is that will relax the pattern across much of North America, allowing for a warm-up to occur, but still dry. This is not a pattern that brings in wet conditions here as we look out uh, past the first week of, uh, of October. Moving forward, it seems as though that trough feature somewhere in the Gulf of Alaska all the way out to day 15 is a persistent feature. And that's something I would like to study and understand. So from there, near-term precipitation. I'm just playing out for you here the next 10 days from the European model. We are watching this weekend a weak system to cut around the backside of that trough, bringing precipitation chances in here into parts of the Dakotas, Iowa, and then as it wraps up into the Great Lakes states, including parts of the eastern Corn Belt, some rain. But we could possibly come back into parts of the Mid-South, including Missouri, Arkansas, and over into uh, um, Oklahoma here, better chances of precipitation. It'll be dry across much of our cotton belt. It'll be dry in the wheat belt. And it won't be until that trough digs in around day 10 that we start to increase our precipitation chances here over um, the Pacific Northwest. But you could make an argument that what you're seeing here and in the Northeast is very characteristic of a La Nina background state, although there are multiple things coming together to give us this pattern. Looking at that same map in terms of percent of normal precipitation, if we do end up getting good moisture transport into this area in the base of that trough, that would be excellent for the fire issues we're having in Northern California and Southern Oregon. But notice around the rest of the country, the really the only place that's showing up much wetter than average is going to be the northeast where everything is gathering. I'll talk about the tropics down here in just a few moments. Looking exclusively at week two now, so this would take us all the way out from the 7th through the 14th of October, we do see the wetter conditions in the Pacific Northwest, but the more relaxed jet stream pattern across this part of the country does paint a drier than normal precipitation pattern. Doesn't mean no rain, but drier than normal. What about the tropics? Anything coming out of the tropics? National Hurricane Center is giving this area a 60% chance of developing, but notice not a whole lot going on here in the main development region. We'll keep an eye on the tropics right here in this part of the um, the Caribbean, but with the jet stream doing something like this, should something emerge, it could possibly come out of 
cut across Florida, and then get pulled here into the jet stream flow. And the likelihood of it developing quickly, rapidly into a strong system is low at this point. But again, European Ensemble not picking up on any development out here in the near term in the open Atlantic Ocean. That's partly because the MJO is over here in phase four, five, and six, which means the best convection is happening in this part of the Indian and Pacific Ocean. There's more suppression of upper level motion everywhere that I'm kind of shading in right now, which is helping, it's one of the factors, that's helping to keep things a bit quieter in the tropics here in the near term. From there though, please remember that the ocean temperatures are still very warm, and we do have a La Nina going on here, which is gonna reduce the wind shear in this area. So that means that when the MJO does break away from this, we could go back over into an active time period at some point in October and throughout November. By the way, the cooler water that you see right here, that is the cold water trail from Hurricane Teddy, which was last week. So from that point moving forward, let's look at the week three, week four precipitation patterns. The models at this point in week three, the 14th through the 20th, do at least agree on bringing in those wetter conditions to the Pacific Northwest. At, at times, the models have kept saying that there's a chance for more precipitation here and possibly even getting up into parts of Ontario, Manitoba, that region, and maybe over toward the Great Lakes, as you see in the CFSV2 model on the left. But I'll be honest with you, I actually don't quite know why the models are doing that. I don't see the upper level height pattern that would suggest that would occur. And as you come into week four, it goes back over to this drier pattern in the central United States with a disagreement between the CFS and uh, CFSV2 and the European on the Pacific Northwest. Very little skill right now being shown in the week three and week four forecasts. From there, I'd like to turn your attention over to temperature and then we'll get back out into the long range. Over the next five days, our highly amplified pattern is very warm west and very cold over the east. When I'm concerned about frost, let's just get this playing here. I'm going to stop it tomorrow morning. We're going to be watching for the potential frost threat here in parts of the high plains getting into this section of Nebraska. From there into Friday, we could see patchy frost in through Nebraska into western Iowa and the parts of the Dakotas, Minnesota, Wisconsin, and northern parts of Michigan. As we get into the weekend on Saturday, I'm going to watch this area here, northern Minnesota, Wisconsin, and this section of Michigan for a frost, but a very cool Saturday morning for much of the eastern Corn Belt getting down at the lower Mississippi River Valley. Sunday, our th threat again kind of moves back into this part of the northern plains, but after that, the pattern as it relaxes here gives us a better chance at seeing some warmer conditions. Day 6 through 10 shows that pattern opening up. You can see the warmth spreading farther to the east in both models. By day 11 through uh, 15, we now see that pattern really hinting at at troughs developing here, more broad scale ridging across the midsection of the country, which as you saw is dry. Now we know that our long range models, again for week three on the top, week four on the bottom, are showing a, a tendency toward warmer conditions. And we know that that's correlated with the developing La Nina, but there's been a pretty significant warm bias. And don't forget, it's October. It's very normal to get fronts that just come blasting out of here uh, quite frequently that could kind of upset the temperature pattern that you see here in the models. But do remember, with La Nina as the background state, we tend to have warmer conditions and more upper level ridging here with more troughs in this section uh, of the Gulf of Alaska. But I just want to make this point very clear here. Long range forecasting using teleconnections in October show very little skill. In fact, they often show very a little skill. But if the base state is dominated by La Nina, that's what we'd expect. Here's the other piece of this that I'm watching. Arctic sea ice. Right now in 2020, we have the second smallest Arctic sea ice extent, 2012 being the leader here, and it's way outside of the normal range. Now, why I'm concerned about that is this particular part of the Arctic going through the Bering Strait, getting into the Bering Sea into the North Pacific, is an area over which I'm going to watch, I'll show it to you again here, for a very strong temperature gradient. Now, why I want to watch that is because that ocean temperature gradient could help be responsible for generating cyclones in this area, extra tropical cyclones. Okay. And therefore, we're going to watch the interplay between the Arctic and this part of the Aleutian Islands for possibly being a, a, a source, a generation source of our pattern. Now, what we saw so far through the month of September is that very same thing with a high sitting here in the Arctic and lows frequently forming over the Aleutian Islands. There's been some downstream support though with general troughing that's been in this part of the Hudson Bay toward Greenland. I want to see if anything's going to touch that pattern, change it, make it move. We do know this, if the La Nina base state continues, 
the correlation with that pattern is shown over here uh, in the map that you've got on, on the right. And that generally suggests that we have troughing here with stronger ridging to its south. Now that tends to take the jet stream pattern and do something like that. That would relax the pattern across North America, giving us warmer conditions. Okay, remember, these correlations are weak. They're right here on this side of zero. This is not a strong correlation. Does the European model, which is shown to you over here on the left, suggest that could happen through the month of October? Well, I do see that one of its more dominant features is the trough here, Aleutian Islands to the Gulf of Alaska, with a ridge feature coming across this part of the Pacific. And I do see that, which means the upstream pattern is correlating well with that, but no strong indications of the development of a subtropical jet stream at this point. In fact, I still see kind of split flow here. You know, following the contours, we do see troughing in here. And that is not necessarily well represented when you come over here to our correlation map, but the correlations are weak. The upstream pattern, which would be in the Atlantic and in, the, in Europe, is kind of similar, but not. Specifically, this feature and the troughs here are currently not in place as well. So I'm just telling you that La Nina has an influence on this, but it's not the most dominant. And as we work our way through October, November, we're going to have to start paying attention to the interaction between the stratosphere and the troposphere. So that's going to be more discussion about things like the polar vortex and the Arctic Oscillation and what happens in the North Atlantic that's going to dominate our pattern. I think at this point, we're at a very low predictability time of the year. We're going to watch this upstream pattern in the Pacific to really dominate what's going to happen across North America. From there, I would like to tell you one thing, though. In winter, so I'm defining this as December through March, if La Nina is the most dominant factor. Ridging here is going to be critical. That could help the development of a subtropical jet stream pattern, which could help with California. Uh, we will also watch for the flow pattern to come over that ridge into the Pacific Northwest, meaning cold, snowy Pacific Northwest, and a jet stream pattern that brings a lot of clippers through the United States. Depending on where the ridge sets up, if it sets up over the southeast here, strong subtropical winds will race through the country, giving us an extremely active pattern in the midsection of the U.S. toward the northeast. So we have something to be watching carefully for this upcoming winter pattern. But as I'll say one more time, the correlations are weak. They're not strong. They're not way up here or down here on our, on our graph. So we're going to watch this carefully, and we'll keep you updated, all right? Hope you all have a great rest of your day. We'll talk to you again tomorrow morning. Thanks.